My question is, when we're looking at Islam and making a decision, sure. what is the framework, or is there a framework? There's Quran, Hadith, right. and then what I thought was something called Ijma that's underneath it. There is, okay. And within the Islamic finance realm, mm. people refer to themselves as muftis and other titles, gotcha. and they get fatwas. And I thought that was Ijma, but then I sort of learned no. earlier from one of the brothers that Ijma relates to something that was verified many years ago. Sure, so let, let me break it yeah. down. So we have the Quran, obviously this is the words of Allah. Right. This is, I mean, no doubt to its authority, right? Then we have Hadith. In Hadith, we have types. Go ahead. How are you? Sure. Uh, what do you guys know about Islam already? Do you want a Quran? Do you want a kind of intro book? All right, cool, go for it. Okay, so when you have the Quran, no doubt it is what we call muhkam, that we take hukam, we take rulings from it, right? In the Quran, now you have uh, verses where we look at it and we look at the context, right? We don't just take the Quran and interpret any way we like, as some people do nowadays, unfortunately, due to the diseases in the hearts of people. We look at, okay, when was this ayah revealed? Is there a nasikh mansukh? Is there an abrogation issue? Meaning, was this in an early part of Islam? And then was there a later order? Because obviously everything came in stages, right? right. If all of the Sharia came at once, it would be very difficult for everybody to just take it in one day, right? So, because people had become so used to drinking and zina and uh, usury and all of that, that rulings came in, in, in stages, so people would be prepared for it. Okay, so that's the Quran. Then you have hadith. No doubt that we accept hadith as an authority, muhkam. It is a part of wahi, what Allah revealed to the Prophet ﷺ. But in hadith, now you have the judging of the hadith, meaning is it authentic? Because the Quran is one book, we've memorized it. Alhamdulillah, brother standing here, memorized it. Uh, we have manuscripts, it's very easy. We have it done. Hadith, we have a lot, meaning a lot of things were reported, attributed to the Prophet ﷺ. So the great scholars of Islam, may Allah reward them, with the guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they made a beautiful, precise science on checking hadith, right? Ilm okay. al-Rijal, and we have videos on the Majlul Riba yeah. channel that talks about how we judge hadith. So, if a hadith is sahih, it's authentic, then we take it. If it's weak, if it's fabricated, if it's uh, rejected, then we reject it. Then we have, in that hadith, we also look at context, right? When was the hadith? Was it during a time of war? Was it in time of peace? Travel? Non-travel? We look at the context. And then we have a system called fiqh, right? The fiqh. Okay. Fiqh is the uh, implementation of the Quran and authentic ahadith by deriving rulings into our daily lives. Okay. Right? So, for example, the Sharia ah tells us that you must establish the salah. Okay. That's it. I mean, Allah says, Aqim salah. No doubt we have to pray. As Muslims, we have to pray. Okay. Now, how many prayers are there? How many rakat? How many units in each salah? How, how, what do we recite in those? Now we're going to look at the Quran and we're going to look at a sahih ahadith. And now we're going to bring all of that evidence. Like we're not just going to make it up like Christians that are like, oh, just pray like this. Or Jews like throw live chickens on your head or whatever they do nowadays. We, we don't do that. We have to look at the Quran and Sahih Hadith. Okay. But the fuqaha, the great scholars of fiqh, then will take those and say, okay, this hadith is applicable during traveling. Meaning when the Prophet ﷺ, for example, combine the prayers, Dhuhr, Asar, Maghrib, yeah. Isha. And they will say, okay, it's not applicable when you are a resident because hadith context, right? They, they derive those rulings. It's called fiqh, right? Then there is a concept called Qiyas. Yeah. Qiyas. What is Qiyas? People misunderstand. People think Qiyas is like ulema just sit around and kind of figure things out. That's not what Qiyas is. Qiyas is when there is a clear ruling in the Quran, in the Hadith, and then there is a new situation that is not there. Now we have, as we know, this, this is a guidance till the Day of Judgment, right? But new things will come up. Like what is the ruling on reading the Quran on your cell phone? Well, obviously in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, they didn't have cell phones. So are we going to say the cell phone is like the Mus'haf itself or is it like a reflection? So now you have the concept of Qiyas, right? So what do those scholars do? They look at the evidences, right? I'll give you an easy example. What is the Islamic ruling on heroin, right? Okay. Well, obviously we don't have an ayah that mentions heroin by name. We don't have a hadith because this was not a substance that was used in the time of the Sahaba. So now we say, okay, what is the ruling? 
on alcohol. Well, it's haram. Why is it haram? What is the illah? What is the reasoning here? It intoxicates, okay? What does heroin do? Does it intoxicate? Yes. Does it harm? Yes. Does it kill you? Yes. Okay. Then we do fara. We extend that ruling out to the new situation. Got it. And that is why even on the moon, even in Mars, if we get there, we can pray, we can fast. Because we, all those new situations, we will use the, the framework of payas to get the rulings. Tayyib. Then there is ijma, which you mentioned earlier. Ijma means a consensus. Right? And what is the I will explain that. That means that all the mushtahid, all the higher level qualified scholars from all the different madhahib, Hanafi, Shafi, Maliki, Hanbali, Zahiri, others, all of them in a generation came together to agree on an issue. In a right. generation. Now, does right. that apply to the current generation or only historical generation? No, that's a good question. It could, but it would just be very difficult, right? How would we establish that scholars in Senegal and Malaysia right. and China have all agreed on this issue, right? That's when the time of Sahaba, this is the best ijma. It's very easy to establish the, the consensus of the Sahaba. Past that, we will say that it does apply because the Prophet ﷺ told us that my ummah will not come together on a mistake, right? So the concept is there, the practical, the practical implementation becomes very muddy. And that's why you get a lot of false claims of ijma. Right. There is ijma, this is ijma, but then you'll find scholars disagree on it. So there is no ijma. If qualified scholars disagree, then there is no ijma, right? Got it. Yeah. So ijma would be that everybody across the board agreed on something, and right? And that's what's happening.